work. It's yeah. working. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. We're, uh, my name is Gary Swan, and we always my smart son. <laughs> and Jack, Jack keeps us on the right move. So, um, I think uh, where we start from is that the most important thing you can do for your health and the health of the planet is to eat locally grown food. Uh, I mean, we're just driving food too many miles in an era of uh, climate disruption. So, uh, if you can grow some of your food, uh, are, are you gardeners? Yeah. Yeah, you guys? Yeah, good. Well, that's the good start, right? The more you can do it. And uh, uh, why, why we settled in on uh, biodynamics? Uh, we had a, a friend of ours, uh, Edna Cox, now deceased, but she was uh, uh, a Waldorf school teacher, which uh, Stein, Rudolf Steiner did that for young children and up to, think, to, to uh, have his influence on the younger generation, and Edna had that. She did that, and she also knew a man that had uh, quite a good biodynamic farm in between Paradise Valley, Paradise Valley on up Swamish. the Swamish, right? What was his name again? Ferdinand von Druska. Ferdinand von Druska. So we went, Louis and I went, when he, he had he trained people for about a week in the spring and another week in the fall. So Louie and I went to a spring one, and then Louie went for about five springs and five, five uh, fall ones, and learned uh, how to do the biodynamic stuff. So he knows more than anybody else in this community. And, how to uh, do the biodynamic. Now, why is biodynamic, in our view, why is biodynamics important? Uh, in about the 1850s, uh, scientists of those days uh, separated all kinds of chemicals. And then they were eventually uh, got into the agriculture thing. So there was chemicals and chemicals and chemicals. Some of them were good, help things grow, and a lot of them turned out to be poisons, pesticides, things like that. So uh, that's not so good when you have poisons or food that travels a long way to, uh, to keep us going, right? And, so they asked the folks that were farmers in those in Central Europe, uh, Steiner, what can we do about it? Because they, chemicals were put into agriculture in about the 1850s. And they finally had livestock and stuff that weren't surviving because of the chemicals and poisons and things like that. And uh, they asked Steiner, well, what can we do about it? So eventually, in about 1924, 28, something like that, he, he said, well, I'll look at the idea and I'll give it a talk. So he did about eight lectures in that period of time. And, and out of it, I think it, he says, well, you got to have a, a humus-based agriculture. I think that showed up somewhere in here. So humus is the life of the soil, microorganisms, and, uh, and uh, 
So they, they took it up and uh, cleaned up. And so for, for healthy food, non-poison food, and humus-based food is, uh, is uh, compost and humus is the key to a, a healthy life and a healthy food source. So that's why we're doing this. We hope that one or two of you will tr try and move away. If you do use poisons, don't bother. Try and move away to uh, the humus-based agriculture biodynamics. And uh, as I told you, Louie knows more about this than anybody else in town, so you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Um, everybody can hear me? Okay. So, biodynamics. No, yeah. I'm closer. Can you get so, bio, bio, oh, maybe I'll get in front of the other one. Yeah. So, biodynamic horticulture is greatly based on cycles. The cycles that affect us daily, monthly, weekly, yearly. It is an evaluation of those cycles. And those cycles are sort of the only constants that life on Earth really has. Um, for instance, the sun rises, the sun sets. The moon rises, the moon sets. And it goes on and on and we get days and then our seasons and we get plant growth and everything like that. And also, it, within those cycles, there is a bigger cycle, a yearly cycle, that the sun ascends from the constellation of Gem or not Gemini, Sagittarius to Gemini, then it descends back down from Sagittarius or from Gemini to Sagittarius. So basically, by the time the by the time summer starts, it's already ended because it has been ascending that whole time and building up and building up to Gemini, and then it starts descending back to Sagittarius again. Now also the moon follows the same cycle, except the moon follows this cycle in 29 and change days, every month. So every month we have the moon ascending through those signs of zodiacs, then descending again. So we have that cycle that's constantly going on. And that cycle, when the moon is ascending, the sap is rising in the plant, rising up. And when the moon is descending, it's going back down into the roots and into the soil. So these are the rhythms of the sun and the moon. Now a lot of people confuse it maybe with the full moon and the new moon, but that is a cycle not between the 12 signs of the zodiac, but that is a cycle between the earth, the moon, and the sun. When we have the full moon, the, you know, this, we're getting the reflection from the sun, and when we have the new moon, the the sun is blocking that reflect, or the earth is blocking that reflection. But those cycles continue on, and through one another, they continue on with one another. So when we we know this in biodynamics, that people have worked on this, that when the, when we are nearing the full moon, we have that excitement of water in everything in the soil, in people, in our tides change. And that's the best time you can sow your seeds is about three or four days before the full moon. Then you are embracing that cycle and you get your seeds to germinate within three or four days after. And that's basically for above ground crops would be that way. But for root crops, you go to the other cycle where you're sowing your seeds before the new moon cycle. And that, that, that's for longer germination seeds, and often root crops are longer germinating seeds. But they belong to that in the earth sort of thing, because that's where they grow. Um, all these cycles happen throughout one another, but the thing that you really have is, when you have the full moon nearing, when you have the moon ascending, then you have these forces of the water pulling up into the planet, and you have the full moon at the same time. So it's very good for if you are 
you know, picking your crops or drying them for oils and for that sort of things, it's best to harvest them when you have an ascending moon because the qualities of it will be a lot better than harvesting them in a descending moon phase. But also within that phase, if you're harvesting root crops and stuff in the ground, you really want to do your harvesting in the descending moon because then all the sap is going into the root of the plant itself. And this is part of biodynamics. It is relationships and disrelationships. Always there, always apparent, but sometimes not even noticeable, but they are there. Now, in biodynamics, there was a lady named Maria Tuned who developed the star calendar, the biodynamic planting almanac. And what she did is she looked at the cycles of the 12 signs of the zodiac and the constellations behind and how they impacted plant growth. She did extensive experiments where she sowed seeds every single day under different under the different signs of the zodiac and then look to see what the seed happens. So if she sowed a seed in a leaf day, say, well, it just grew leaves and no root. But if she sowed it in a fruit day, well, it went right to seed. If she sowed it in a flower day, it went right to flower. But if they were sowed on a root day, they grew beautiful roots and that was how she was able to develop this calendar because all the 12 signs of the zodiac have a different corresponding effect on plants. For instance, Leo is a flower or fruit day, and that's fruit and seeds and those sort of things. But they all, her almanac shows it a lot more in depth than I can. And if you're just starting out in horticulture or doing biodynamics or want to, this is a really good start because this helps give you some insight on to when you should be sowing your crops, when you should be doing your cultivation on your crops to improve that part of the plant which you want to improve. I mean, and it's, I mean, she did this her whole life and now her kids have taken it on. Grandchildren. But, grandchildren, yeah. But also in, in this, the new updated version is a lot better because they get into companion planting where different plants like one another, but also she gives charts on when to sow your seeds on the month and when to harvest them throughout the year, which I thought was a really good addition to this, um, this calendar this time around. So also um, Steiner developed preparations meant to help heal the earth. Many of them made of medicinal herbs, but we'll just go over them briefly here. Um, the first one is 500, and that is cow, cow manure buried in a cow's horn and planted within the cycle of the descending sun in, in the winter months. And then that, that is used to promote root growth in plants. There is also, biodynamics is greatly about balance. So there's the yin and the yang to it. So then there's 501, which is horn silica right here, which is buried in a cow's horn through the summer month. And that is used on plants to help the top grow and sort of thing. Acts like a lens helps the top grow. Now both these things, the 500 really helps with fine root hair development so your plants are able to take on more moisture, grow their roots deeper, where the, the horn silica helps with plant growth, gets your plants growing more vigorously, but not too much. Not like our chemical horticulture does nowadays, where it's pumped full of stuff and it's just growing crazy. This helps a, a proper controlled growth. Also within this, Steiner developed six biodynamic compost preparations. And these were preparations meant to be added to the compost piles as you build them. So on the first one is 502 yarrow. Now I don't know if people know much of yarrow, but it, uh, it grows here in North America. It's probably one of the most widely used herbs in the world to all indigenous people 
for its medicinal purposes, very easy to grow, grows in rocky, gravelly, sandy soil, but has a very strong medicinal qualities. And that's why Steiner chose these preparations to be added to help the compost pile. So instead of just making a compost pile, you're making a healing compost pile that helps heal the earth. Um, yarrow is a huge one medicinally for colds, flus, fevers, bleeding, stuff like that. The qualities it has are just amazing for those things. In Old English, yarrow means spear peel because the plant can be ground up and put in your spear wound and it has antiseptic, antimicrobial, antibacterial and anti-inflammatory capabilities that help make it so you don't get sepsis and die. And I mean, it was so widely used anywhere it grew in the world it's used. Um, they found in a grave of a man buried, a Neanderthal man buried in Iraq 60,000 years ago, and he had yarrow with him. So you can see it's been a long, along with us a lot of times. So that is one of the, the first compost preparation. The second is 503, which is chamomile. And I'm sure people know of chamomile. It's, you know, very calming, really good effect. It is, they say, the mother of all herbs. Actually, in Latin, it's named madre, meaning mother. Um, very good for cramping, bloating, any of those kind of things. It medically it has mild sedative properties, really good for colds, flus, especially in children. Helps lower fever. It's antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory. Has a skin thing, very good for acne and eczema, made as a tea onto your skin and that. So when the flowers are used in that preparation, very, very easy plant to grow. Once you get it growing, often it will self-seed itself and keep going for a long time, or you can save the seeds and start it, but really worthwhile growing as medicine, very strong medicine. Perhaps one of the, you know, when you think about it, chamomiles in all kinds of different teas and stuff that you get. The next one that they use is 504, the stinging nettle plant. Now, I don't know, people know very much about stinging nettle. If you walk through a patch of it, you sure know about it. But I mean, and stinging nettle is just an amazing plant used for years as a spring tonic and a blood purifier. Really helped people come through a long winter after they didn't have much fresh anything. They could cut and steam the green tops and it would help just give them a revitalizing boost. It's one of those great plants that like many herbs, it can be cut three or four times a season. It can be dried. They say when it's fed dry to livestock and chickens, um, cows produce more milk, the meat is better. Chickens produce more eggs, their eggshell is better due to the qualities that it has within it. It is also, was also used um, to make nets, hence the word nettle. Um, used to make paper, um, very good as a fertilizer, really good, the top part added to your compost pile to bring it in. Used as a dye because of its green color. Used um, to really help with hair if you have dark hair and you want a natural dye for your hair, you use stinging nettle tea and it'll dye your hair more, more, more dark. And if you have blonde hair, then you want to use rosemary and it will help your blonde hair. They're sort of, these are old tricks of, you know, many years ago type thing. But also, its medicinal properties are part that, in the stinging part of it, is an amazing thing. It's almost a cross between a plant and an animal, because when you are stung by stinging nettle, the plant physically stings you like hypodermic needles, and you get the sting. But they've also found that these stings are very similar to bee venom, high in formic acid and different things like that, which has proved to be very effective for arthritic complaints among people. Can be, they found it could be very good for Parkinson's, MS, Alzheimer's. It is such a nutritional herb that if it wasn't 
stain, it probably wouldn't have made it in the plant world because it would have just been eaten by everything mm -hmm. off the bat. So, I mean, and I always, we cut it, we dry it. Um, I have a really good book on sacred and herbal he healing beers, which has recipes. So I always try and make some stinging nettle ale, and that sort of stuff, because of beer, it's good for you. So what the hell? <laughs> 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 and also it's, it's a very, once you get it going, it just keeps multiplying and multiplying and could be considered a pest. So if you do plant it, you want to plant it somewhere you can mow around with your lawnmower and that sort of stuff, just to kind of keep it at bay. <laughs> so the next one is um, oak bark and the oak tree, the white oak. And this was the sacred tree of the Druids. And those people back before Christianity came through, the pagan beliefs, um, they say that these giant oak trees, mistletoe would grow in some of them. And the Druid priests would go to the, only a few trees had the mistletoe, so they would go and cut the mistletoe out in a big ceremony. But when Christianity came through, any trees that had the mistletoe, these oak trees, they cut the oak trees down, of course, you know, to, to sort of get rid of that kind of belief. But oak, I mean, is amazing medically. It's very good for diarrhea, for gargle, for sore throats, for bleeding, both internally and externally. Helps tone your tissue. Really good for anemia, dysentery. Um, very high in tannin and was used extensively for tanning leather and perhaps that's what tan, why we call it tan leather because people were using the oak bark and the oak bark is the part we use in the preparation. Unfortunately here on Vancouver Island and where we are, the white oak isn't, doesn't really grow, but Steiner was always adamant that you use what you can in your local area. So here we substitute the Gary Oaks, which grow, because you need a quite an older tree to get the oak bark where it's falling off to be made into the preparation to put into the compost pot. And all these are really powerful medicinal herbs. The next one is 506 dandelion. Now everybody says dandelion. Oh no, dandelion. I mean, most herbicide plant probably in the world. But I mean, most beneficial for our health and lifestyle. And the reason it's all over the world is, you know, when you blow a dandelion and the little parachutes blow off, well, they are so light and small that they're able to get up into the jet stream and start blowing around and literally travel to every place where they will grow, dandelions will grow. And dandelion has uh, very similar to nettle and the spring greens are blood purifier, really high in potassium, really good for that. Also the root, a very powerful liver herb, really good for liver, really helps with jaundice, those sort of things helps you get more bile going in your system. Also, they say that the root can help alleviate gout because it helps with too much uric acid in your in your body. And of course, the greens are so healthy to eat early in the spring, very bitter. Um, the flowers can be made into a very fine wine and a very lovely syrup. Uh, and flowers, if, if you if you want to try it, you can try it. It's but if you take a dandelion flower and you start chewing it up, it starts out very bitter at the start, but the more you chew it, and as your saliva changes the starches into sugar, it ends off sweet. Was extensively used before people would go into battle on fields with spears and whatnot. They would fill up on these dandelion flowers so they had the energy to perform atrocities against one another. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Then we have the different kinds of dandelions that we get the spring ones. So yeah. Yeah. Babies, and then we have the summer ones that have the dry, like the stick. Yeah. Is it all dandelions? Yeah. They're all the same family. Yeah. So I can take yeah. all those flowers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. My mother made dandelion wine like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. 
How about yeah. showing them how big the uh, preparation oh, is? Here, we'll show you. So these amounts are about a tablespoon you need to make almost pile as big as you see there on the thing there. So it's very, Steiner was big on homeopathy. So you don't need a lot of these things, but all these plants, if, well, except for the oak, unless you have room, should be, if you're gonna grow a garden, should be grown in a garden, and many of them don't need so much care. You know, you can have the arrow driving, growing in your driveway, and it'll grow fine and be more than happy too. So the next one in this, the final compost preparation is a flower called valerian. Now I know maybe people have heard of valerian root, used very sedative, really good in sleep stuff, really helps to sleep. For the preparation, we use the flowers made into like a syrup tea, and then it is used, well here it is here in this little jar, it is used in the compost pile again has a lot of very strong properties. It's a very warm plant, has the ability to bring things together. At the end, we stir it in water and then it covers the compost pile to sort of keep everything of the compost pile in. My friend Ferdinand would always say, um, for frost protection, very good. You know how when it snows, the snow covers everything. Well, valerian, when you put it out in a mist, covers everything like snow does, but in a blanket of warmth, and can really help against stuff freezing off, especially when it's really, really cold out. So those are the compost preparations. So those ones are added into the compost in the little bags here. The other ones I spoke of 500 and 501 were what they call field sprays, and they would be stirred in water and then sprayed upon your land. But uh, not a lot, I mean a handful in three gallons of water. So it's not a whole bunch that you need of these things. You don't need a, you don't need tons of them or anything like that. One of the last compost preparations is horsetail. And people say, no oh, horsetail. I don't want that anywhere near my garden. I'll never get rid of it. <laughs> but it is used for fungal protection. It has helped to keep fungus down in the ground and not rising up into your plants. So it can be used on the soil, or if you see your plant has a fungal problem, it can be brewed into a tea, and then 10 to one sprayed on your plant. <coughs> um, really high in silica, that's why, that's why it's so fungal, and it is one of those plants that, where horsetail grows, nothing else would be able to grow because it would be susceptible to fungal problems and die. And as Alan Chadwick said, um, being understood is it becomes a joy. So that plant is understood. It's also a very old plant. They were trees back in prehistoric times. And then they were able to evolve or disevolve down to live with us nowadays. Just how the birds started out as dinosaurs, then were able to evolve back down to become the birds that we have today and, and survive. So those are the, those, that is a preparation on its own that you use, you know, you dry it and then you brew it and you stir it up and you put it on your tea, on your plants. The last one isn't really a comp compost preparation, but I felt it was worth mentioning and that is the plant comfrey. I don't, people, may not know much about comfrey, but comfrey is the same as nettle. It grows very good. It can be cut three or four times a year and then used on your compost pile. Helps bring in trace minerals, all kinds of other things. Has big medicinal qualities of roots for sprains, bone injury, inflammation, and that sort of stuff. I twisted my ankle, I guess last week, and I've been putting the comfrey poultice on it every night and it was a big swell but now it's gone down and my ankle feels better and I mean it really helped me out because if I would have went to the doctor he couldn't have really done anything except giving me maybe painkillers and anti-inflammatories and told me to wrap my leg and keep it up 
But I mean, I'm a farmer, I got, a, I got a stuff to do. I can't be sitting around with my leg up. So I just put the poultice on and hook it on my leg and there you go. And you know, really makes a big difference. So a lot of these remedies are huge in keeping us healthy. And that's why I think Steiner realized that they would be good for the health of the plant. There's also one last preparation that we have here in this jar, and that's something called barrel compost. And barrel compost is just cow manure, eggshells, and basalt that is rhythmically mixed for an hour, then buried in a, in a barrel in the ground with two sets of these compost preparations added into it, and it helps to break down organic matter. Really good for breaking down organic matter, really good for use in the compost, really good as a field spray, and those sort of things. So very important for the biodynamics is to use the barrel compost. They're saying to maybe, they haven't done a lot of studies on it, but they think it may be effective in stopping your food from becoming radioactive by not allowing the radioisotopes to go inside the food and contaminate the food. There hasn't been a lot, lot of studies done on it, maybe there won't be many, but it was originally developed when they were igniting um, you know, nuclear weapons up in the stratosphere kind of thing, so they wanted to have a way that we could sort of protect ourselves, so it makes a lot of sense. The last one, the second to last part I'll talk about is making compost. And that is the heart of biodynamics. One of the three rules I heard once was spray, pray, and make compost. And the spraying is putting out the 500 and the corn manure and the barrel compost. And the praying is meditative praying. And the making compost is the key to it all, of making more humans, as my father spoke of. And home compost making can be very big. We make big, big piles of compost, but it can be done at home. You, all, you can make a compost pile that's basically three feet by three feet, and it will be a fine compost pile. Location is a, important when thinking of where to make your compost pile. You want it to be in a shady location, not in so much direct sunlight, but away from big trees. So you gotta sort of find out where your area can be. It helps if it's on a bit of a slant because when you make a compost pile, you can't add too much water. When we make our compost piles, we have someone holding the hose with the water and it's running the whole time as we're building the pile and it drains out. A lot of people go wrong when they make compost is they don't add any water to it at the time they're making it. They just sort of throw it all in dry and hope it's gonna do do some, and you know, it may, but it's much better if you do it that way. We like to stockpile all our ingredients and make our compost pile on, in one day from what we've stockpiled, but that's not necessary at all. You can do a compost pile where you do a level at a time, but the most crucial thing that most people do, don't do is they throw too much stuff in and they don't have soil or manure in between the layers to act and don't have enough water, of course, as they build it. But if you do the method properly, you can just take your grass clippings, and I've made fine compost with just grass clippings and soil. A layer of three to four inches grass clippings, three to four inches of, you know, a couple inches of soil, and then on and on it goes, and then close it up as soon as it gets tall enough. Um, in town, um, you can, you need to keep it covered so it doesn't dry out. So I often use, you know, cardboard, wet it down cardboard, and that keeps the moisture in, helps keep the sun off if it's in a sunny location. We also do some additives. We'll make it with the barrel compost, but also as we make it, on the soil layer, we make a clay slurry. And the soil layer, you got the clay on it, so the clay particles, help bind and help you get this really um, kind of sticky compost that you can sort of see here. You can come up and look at it after. And um, that, that's the clay part. But in the green part, you add some lime. And the lime helps stop, smooth, 
slow the breakdown so not so much nitrogen is leached out of your green material that's added. And I mean, it's far better, as Chadwick always said, it's far better to use green material fresh than letting it dry out and making it into compost because all the, the vitality is still in it when it's fresh. But as soon as it dries, it's gone into the, into the universe again. And you want that to be in the pile, breaking down and those sort of things. He was also very adamant about everything that you grow should be returned to the pot, if you can. All your weeds, all your different things like that. And weeds are so good in the compost pile because all our other plants that we sort of done with our help and their help, we've made them into what we want to suit us. You know, lettuce and our different things that we grow nowadays, but the weeds still have that they still have that connection to totality because they're still part of totality. And of course, we're all part of totality, but they have it more than anything, more than the culture plants do. So very good. And also, if you have really pernicious bad weeds, if you don't want to put all your dandelions in your compost because in fear that they'll start growing, there's a way that you can make them so they won't. You can basically drown them in water in a bucket of water for, oh, I don't know, three three months or so. And when the water starts smelling like manure, then you know it's good to go and you can make it into compost. <laughs> and we, we do that a lot with the pernicious weeds we have on our farm. Um, also, all your little sticks and prunings, really important when you build a compost pile, is to have those sticks and stuff as a little bottom layer to help air get into the compost pile and really help with that. But composting is the key if you can. And I mean, the com kind of compost you can buy commercially is not, not very good. It's often made with a lot of wood. So then instead of having bacterial compost, which is what vegetables want, you have something more fungal, like fungal compost, which would be fine for perennial flowers, rhododendrons, berries, those sort of things, but really not so great for your vegetable garden. So always, that's sort of the problem. Like we have some commercial compost here, and you know, when you come look at it, it's mostly wood. It doesn't really stick together, sort of dried out. But I mean, that is what most people have access to. And if that's all you have access to, keep in mind that when you do do it, you want to add, um, you want to add lime to it just so you can get it more towards basic and not so much towards fungal, if you can help it break down more. Um, the last part I guess I'll say is on making heaven on earth. And that's what the goal of biodynamics is, of course, is to try and make your yard or your small building into heaven and earth. And that, that depends on a lot of things. I know if you live in the Alberni Valley and you don't have a fence that can keep the deer out, you really should get a fence to keep the deer out because it's so heartbreaking to have your stuff grow and then the deer come eat it. So that it's just preventative kind of things. Also, a really good idea if you can, you have roof drains, is to install some sort of rainwater harvesting system because that is very good for watering your young seedlings and your babies with. They're very, very easy to install. You know, they sell them at home hardware and different places like that, the barrels, and you can install them and you can have the overflow just goes right back into your perimeter drain out, out of your house. So it's no big deal, but then you have this really good water. Another thing that really helps is a small greenhouse. It doesn't have to be big. I mean, the greenhouse at my wife's, I think it's eight by six. And I mean, we grow so many tomatoes and stuff in it, but it gives you a good place to grow your tomatoes in and cucumbers, but it also gives you an up on everything that you can have your little baby tomatoes, you can sow them in March, and you can have them ready to be put into the garden or into your bigger greenhouse earlier in the season. Plus it gives you a long extension on your crops in the fall, is that you can sow spinach later and be able to eat it, or sow winter lettuce, or grow some kale in it all year long. So you just have food all year long. 
I mean, I, I always sow kale and I still have kale growing in char, but where my wife lives is down by the water there, by the ocean. So it's quite a bit warmer than where my parents' farm is. So certain things all, all depends on your microclimate and where you live. But very important to kind of do, to get into stuff is to think about those things before you dive right in. And a lot, biodynamics is a lot more than just growing vegetables and food for yourself. It's about growing food for everyone, for the birds, the bees, the insects, the spiders, the slugs, the snails. I know Alan Chadwick always said that you grow so much, but so much of your stuff should be saved for nature and creation because that's the way it ought to be. You shouldn't be killing off everything because you want it all or, you know, this is your spot. You fenced it, you said this, you said, okay, I'm making $2,000 off this spot and that's the way it's got to be. And of course, it might work out for you. You might get your $2,000 and all that comes along with that. And that's just part of it. But it's really, you have to approach this as a part that you are part of nature and creation and not divorced from nature and creation. You know, when you think about our modern day horticulture is greatly divorced from nature and creation is that they only see it in a monetary game sort of thing. And that, that's it, you know, and it's very, that's why of course they're using these fertilizers and these pesticides and this and that, you know, when you think our grain industry is atrocious, that they spray the fields with Roundup to kill everything, then they sow their grain, then they spray it again before they're going to harvest their grain with Roundup again, so it kills the plant, so the grain is easier to thrush. And this is all to make it easier so we can get Wonder Bread white bread. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's, uh, where have we gone? We've really we've gone crazy with what we're doing and I mean that's where doing your own garden can really help and it's a lot of uh, flowers, shrubs, cane fruit, berries, fruit trees, vegetables. If you think about it, do some honeybees. Find out about honeybees. Nut trees if you have a big enough holding to do those sort of things. And then along with that many other things come up because once you start going on it you you can get into stuff like home canning, preserving, drying, all these sort of things that are part of doing this whole thing that helps us all a lot, lot more than we are just getting stuff from the store and this and that. And, you know, you gotta figure when electricity goes, anything frozen, it's, it's no good, but anything canned will keep for you because your initial investment is just put in in the heating and time to can it. Also with this technique is a lot about saving your own seeds. You can save your seeds from your tomatoes, your peas, your beans, potatoes. Um, the grain I grow, I save my seed. I mean, grain's great. One grain seed will grow a flower that gives you like 30 other seeds. So it's a real multiplication every time you do it. And also, of course, with this technique comes importance of proper pruning. When you get fruit trees, keeping the proper pruning is important and your shrubs, you want to keep them pruned because the goal is that you want them to branch out more. So they start doing more branches, more fruit and flower buds, and then you get more fruit. And it also does two things, is that it keeps your tree down enough that you can pick it without going up on the 30 foot ladder to pick it and those sort of things. So, and, and I've learned a lot in, you know, planting different trees, and I've learned one thing is that the stuff that grows good in the Alberni Valley are plums, pears, apples, peaches and nectarines, and those things are very tricky. They don't like our wet climate. Cherries the same way, and cherries are so hard because the birds seem to get them off. Yeah. So if you want cherries, you gotta just buck up and buy them. I mean, they're not. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend going ahead and planting a cherry tree. But a plum, a pear, and an apple, you're gonna get some fruit. You might have to fight off the bear a bit, but that's that's all part of it. It's being, being prepared when you see your fruit drop is to pick it and do the work on it. You know, you probably won't have problems with bears if you go out every day and pick the apples up and fall. <laughs> and if they're not right, 
then you just, they go into the compost pile. And if you've done your compost pile properly, then uh, there won't be a smell because you've used the preparations, you've used barrel compost, so you don't have that putrid smell coming that attracts stuff that's already starting to become soil. And of course, biodynamics works a lot on companion planting, dislikes and likes. So many, companion planting is very important. I know if you have tomatoes, if you plant your basil with your tomatoes, it'll do better. Parsley with tomatoes, and on and on, every kind of other thing like that. I know one of the companion plant to everything they say is lemon balm. And lemon balm grows fabulously. And it will spread around, but it is a companion to everything. And it has such a strong thing to it. It's a lightly sedative, antidepressive, antiviral, and immune stimulating. So very good for the body, really good in tea, really good dry. Um, it's just incredible stuff. And also, I think about this more, when I'm thinking about it is here we are, that we've gone so far with our horticulture and agriculture, but we kind of lost touch with nature, is that we are no longer working with nature, we're trying to control nature. And of course, at no time can that really be done. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. We try our best and, you know, we put up walls so the flood won't come. I mean, what River Road that they built here, they built that after the last tsunami that came through as a, as a water break. But you can bet the next big tsunami that comes over will go roar right over that, no problem, right? Where they could have maybe made a way that they, were, they could take that extra volume of water and put it out somewhere else and not put a bunch of houses there. It could have just been saved as farmland. And because then if the farmland floods, it's, it's detrimental. But it's not as bad as having everyone's homes taken away kind of thing. And of course, with our commercial horticulture, we've so, our soils are so depleted that we've become so dependent on chemical fertilizers. And of course, what chemical fertilizers do is that they, um, they kill off soil micro microbiology and they end up loading the soil with salts. And then eventually your soil won't grow anything. I mean, the analogy is if all you drank was Gatorade, eventually you'd die because your body would be so full of salt. And people say, oh, well, it's got electrolytes. Well, I mean, what the hell's electrolytes? It's got salt and food coloring and everything. You're better off to drink water or drink herbal teas. You're gonna feel a lot better. And also, too, the, the use of herbicides that is so widely used in commercial horticulture because they're growing these plants that are growing out of timing with the natural cycle. They're just so whenever, pump full of chemicals, growing like crazy, and they're just, they're out of balance and out of whack with the whole constant of our lives. And of course, then that becomes a problem. Then you get pests in because these, they're, they're not surviving well. They're not doing well. So the pests come in and they eat all the plants and, and they love it and love it and love it but it's not that good for them. So it's just like, if you ate white bread all the time, you might you can eat as much as, it, as you want, and you'll never really be satisfied. You gonna let people ask questions? We are, one sec. <laughs> and, then, and so then you eat the white bread and white bread, and then you're never satisfied. So bugs that eat plants that are falsely grown out of time, it's the same thing. And what do they do? They do what humans do when they're unsatisfied. They breed like fury, and then you have to pass. <laughs> so I mean, we're sort of at this crossroads of what, what are we gonna do to survive as a species? And we're gonna have to really go back to nature and creation and let that guide us. So that's it. This was yeah. the first time I got a so thank you. <laughs>
I'm Dr. Swan. <clears throat> I just wanted to mention to people sort of uh, some quite basic stuff. I mean, most of you make compost piles, and I did compost piles for about 40 years as an organic gardener before I knew about biodynamics. And I had to turn those suckers all the time, right? Because you build the layers, and then you'd have to get in with your shovel and turn it and mix it. Well, when I found out that biodynamics you have to turn a compost heap because of these, uh, what do you call these things? Preparations. The preparations that are added to each level. So you don't have to physically turn it. Because what happens with the preparations is that chemical mixing happens on its own, folks. So when we build this one, which we're going to build another one just like it on Sunday at Lee Farm at 10 o'clock. Those things are big. You can tell by the size of the people around them. You don't have to get in there with your shovel and turn the top to the bottom and the outside to the inside. So it's just so much less work. And you get this wonderful compost as well. So that to me was a really exciting thing because it took the work of doing compost you made it twenty percent as much work as I used to do with my old organic way, and you get a better quality compost. So I really found that an exciting thing to do, especially as I don't actually do it. I just make the cookies for the folks who are doing it. So that's even better. I happen to have some of my leftover seeds here. If anyone's interested in getting seeds, they're from last year, so that's why they have a really. Um, reasonable price of two dollars. I think they'll germinate fine for you, but if they don't, you know where I live. <laughs> so our intention is that everybody gets a cup full of the barrel compost to use on your next We're going to show you how to mix it up here in a second, but I'll just say this compost here we made last November and it's already soil or already compost. So it really goes to show that this method works because what are we now? We're just the end of Feb mid February mm -hmm. and it's all ready, ready to go. Are you taking questions? Oh, yes. Um, what's clay slurry? Um, clay slurry would be just like a handful of clay in water okay. mixed up, and that would be clay have, slurry. We have lots of clay here. Yeah, yeah. Can I keep going for a moment? No, it's. Um, Oops, sorry. Do you use, do you, or do you recommend water off of asphalt roofs for food gardens? Uh, I mean, I know, I know what my wife, we have an asphalt roof and yeah. we... Yeah, just repeat. Oh, there you go. Thanks, John. Yeah, so, um, water off asphalt roofs. I know at my wife's place, we have an asphalt roof and we use it. We haven't had that much detrimental, any problems that yeah. I've really noticed. Okay. Yeah. But I know in the, the rainwater harvesting guys recommend metal roofs are the best yeah. if you can and then followed by wood then asphalt or you know tiles or something. You might just have to get you might just have to evolve so that we can absorb asphalt too because it's coming out of water. <laughs> well I mean and, but the rainwater is just gonna be better quality yeah. than yeah. the chlorinated water yeah. just because it's the rainwater. I mean, we have a bath that's sitting out somewhere. Yeah. It gets rain in it. it takes a while. Yeah. Sooner or later, it gets full. I feel like buckets of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so there's one last thing we want to show people is for these field sprays and for the barrel compost here, it needs to be rhythmically stirred for 20 minutes to to then be ready for use on the area. So we will demonstrate how to do that for people. And of course, the, the stirring is vortexes. So a vortex one way, the breaking of the vortex the other way. And that was developed a lot because when you think about the way our world is, it's all vortexes. When you think of hurricanes and typhoons, they're vortexes. When you think of how our small solar system is spinning around us, it's a vortex. When you think that the Milky Way galaxy is spinning in a vortex towards the Cygnet galaxy, but it, all that in nature, and when you think of how 
water runs down the creek. It runs in little vortexes. As the waves hit the beach, it's a vortex that way. So that is harnessed in it. When you look at it, this is why the cow's horn is used for the preparations is because it's got the vortex part to it. And that's why cows center around being the, the animal that Steiner chose for biodynamics because their horns collect that cosmic energy mm -hmm. in from the cosmos. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you want to explain what they are? Maybe sharp and see what they are. So this is like the bare compost, which is the pounded earth with the basalt and the eggshells. And three loads of two loads of preparations. Preparations. Yeah. That's the key to what all Well and it, it is the carrier of the preparation. So when you start biodynamics. This is kind of the first thing you can do for your land is to mix this and put it all over your land. And it helps bring the biodynamic influence to your land, the medicinal medical parts. So it's basically you just take the vortex one way, get a good vortex going, then you go the other way, break the vortex, and then you go the other way. I mean, this one's not too bad, it's only 20 minutes or 15 or 10 minutes. You want to use non chlorinated water if possible, or if you have only chlorinated water, just let it sit out for a couple of days and that will help leave the chlorine off it. The other two field sprays, the 500 and the horn silica, they need to be stirred for an hour to bring what it's trying to say an hour is a cosmic second. And it's a very meditative thing to stir something for an hour. I find when I'm stirring it for an hour, things happen and you end up meditating and things sort of come to you, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we'll give everybody some of that. And also, before I go, we're gonna do one other thing in biodynamics. They talk about trees as cosmic harmonizers. Uh, at one time, trees were the antennas of the earth that collected this cosmic rays coming in and helped bring it down into the mother earth from Father Sky. So we will show a way that we can realign a tree to become a cosmic harmonizer again. This has been greatly depleted by our actions, our radio waves, our you know, Wi-Fi and this sort of stuff, 5G and 6G. So could Char show the, um, the biodynamic other about five minutes long? You yeah, yeah. There's maybe two of them yeah. while you're stirring. Sure. Uh, so the, yeah, maybe she can. Uh, we'll see. Maybe she can. Yeah, who knows if I can. <laughs> I don't know. Fingers crossed. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm doing that. Yes, that's right. Here is a couple of his most recent 
sort of Steiner said as well is that we're at one time in our history we had a lot of ceremonies we performed and did and rituals and whatnot and nowadays we've kind of lost that our, our ceremony is check out my Facebook account or this or that kind of stuff or you know big ceremonies are people get married and, and that sort of stuff so we we don't do that much anymore Shopping malls are Humanity's last stand. 
is an extreme way of looking at food production in a changing world. And for the swans, it called for an extreme lifestyle change, a new way of thinking that began with the biodynamics calendar, a celestial schedule that would shape their lives. This is the third, so it's in the morning and a bit of a break and then flower. The calendar tells you that it's a good time to do this or it's a good time to do that. Where are the planets and the sun and everything in relationship to what you're doing? Like, for example, today is what's known as a root day. So what are we doing? We're working with weeding roots or our young fellow there is weeding a carrot bed, right? Um, things kind of rotate. Well, at first it was a bit strange, but, you know, I went down the rabbit hole <laughs> and I'm still deep down there. The rabbit hole that Louis is referring to is a belief system that views the farm as completely self-enclosed. Everything used on the farm is produced on the farm, and all of it synchronized with planetary cycles and movements. The highland cattle eat yard and garden waste, producing the manure used in biodynamic compost. Today, on the new moon, they're turning manure and stepping in rhythm, making barrel compost. It's just how many were with the small ground of salt and each other, spurred together, mixed together with the condensed. It gives you you know, 50 meters of barrel compost, which can be used like a handful in about 10 meters of water and stirred in the biodynamic way. And it would do all, all the acreage here. Gary is eager to share what he's learned, inviting those who are interested to be part of building larger compost heaps, which look familiar, but which in the biodynamic tradition are symbolically shaped like cows, with healing herbs inserted where the lungs, heart, and kidneys might be. It revolves around uh, various preparations. There are six medicinal herbs that are put in homeopathic forms, like a bit and a handful in uh, 40 tons of, of potential compost. So that's homeopathy for the earth, and uh, uh, that's what you're trying to use, trying to heal the earth and get the nutritional quality out of the food, the higher nutritional qualities as part of what you're producing. And it does, it is. But I would say really want when we are connecting with the Mother Earth and Father Sky, so there's always that sort of thing that you're working with. And so many people don't, you know, the, the cosmos affects our lives every day. It affects plant growth, it affects how people feel, it affects the energy that's put into water, it affects the energy that's put into rocks and animals and insects and all kinds of stuff. It's not an easy concept to explain or to understand, but the Swans Farm is highly productive. And although it's anecdotal, the family is satisfied that biodynamics is the reason. We know and we feel it because you can see it. And that is, I guess, science in a way, is an observation. Isn't it? Is an observation the sort of foundation of a scientific approach? They're just a family, just local farmers growing and selling produce, teaching their techniques and approach to those who will listen. But for the Swan family, it's so much more. It's hope. There's a poem in there that at the end of it says, what did you do once you knew? So what did you do once you knew that there was a climate disaster? You know, I, I've been an active person in the community, done some what I consider to be useful things. And I think this is going to be the most useful. You know, there is the possibility of this community having a chance to feed most of its nutrition from the local way, right? And the basis of it is a sustainable agriculture. Yeah, it's not an Splash it around and we'll harmonize the tree if people want to <laughs> go yeah. even deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Is, there, um, is there no, I thought Mount White Oak grows here, none of the oak. 
Um, yeah, well, people have planted white oak trees, yeah. Yeah, but there's there's a big one that grows on First Avenue yeah. over where I live. I mean, they're they're big. But they're not. Um, they're no, they're, they are, I do believe those ones were white oak that someone probably planted. They're not native. Yeah. They're not native to here. The native one is the Jerry Oak. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the white oaks, apparently, in the one book I had, they said the biggest one on record was measured in the 1650s, yeah. and it was 90 feet across by like 300 feet of the canopy. Just incredible trees. And of course, they went to build all the sailing ships yeah. that came here, and England, when it burned down a few times, they had rebuilt it a couple times with those oaks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, you go out, we'll stay right here. In case anyone wants to ask us what. Um, <laughs> anyone who wants to go out in the rain with Louie and what are you going to do out there? We're just going to be one second and talk to a tree. Okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk to a tree. Barrel compost. Oh, we'll put out the barrel compost at the end. Well, we'll take it with us because we should put some around the tree. <laughs> Put the preparations in. That's great. And thank you. Next Sunday, this Sunday coming up, oh, the 19th, yeah. 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Right. at our farm. Do you know where we live? I don't think you know. The corner of the you know, Cypress yeah. Boulevard and Batty Road. So if you've ever driven up to the Plain Mill, from from uh, from Cherry Creek, <laughs> you probably got lost very close to our place. <laughs> I'm on the ill-fated river road. Oh, well, you're a little on the other side, side of the. So hang around. Yeah. For, for you, driving in Texas. Texas. Well, I'm uh, 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 very good. Ground. You're gonna be rabbit. Oh yeah, yeah. No. Everything's good. Oh, okay. Cows, cows are the. Well, you get the biggest volume. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Oh, yeah. That'll, that'll yeah. Eight shells and. Yeah, eight shells. Yeah. And what do you say? What's the other one? Basalt. Basalt? Basalt. Volcanic rock. You know, like the pumice kind of rock. It's black. Yeah. I don't hear it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Same as me. <laughs> <laughs> most of our island is made of basalt. Yeah. 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 But the one thing that's worth, worthy of getting is the fire man. Um, yeah, the, the star calendar is definitely very good. I'm showing you. My but my I stuff. Then, if you want to take it home, you won't be able to plant by it, but you can read about what to do. Yeah. And a lot of these books, like I always recommend this book to people. Country Wisdom Gnome. Yeah, it's, it's a great book. It has, I mean, yeah, oh, it's got everything from making everything you can imagine in it. And also, um, the How to Grow More Food book. Yeah, by John Jacobs. Very good. This, yeah, this is a book from a kid that was training us. When I was 12 years old, standing there. Yeah, I, mean, I know. I bought it for my friend for his birthday a couple years ago, so it's still available. It's still available to go to the box. But that one is just the one I'm using. I'm keeping it on the fence. I'm going to get you now. I'm going to get you now. I'm going to get you now. Oh, and that's good. Yeah, we've got a big one, but we really blew it all. Yeah, but Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But I don't grow anything back there. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and there's no access to that. Yeah. My cousin says, "Why don't you build a little granny house back there?" <laughs> so, but but the only thing that goes back there is the deer that jump over the fence, mm -hmm. and they go and they eat the some of the grass and stuff because they won't come in the other yard because of the dog. The dog will no way get out of here. So, okay, I got one. I got two. I don't care what they are. <laughs> These are the little short ones. These little tucker. Oh yeah, okay. My mom grew those. Well, oh, they're the more red, so they're these ones. Oh yeah, my mom grew those every year. Mm -hmm. She had, she and could. They grow well, and these are the big ones. Yeah. I think they're out of our mind to be free. I think I'm going to take the last one of these, because I don't think these are pretty. They are pretty. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Most of them like sun? Most of them like sun? Yes. Oh, yeah. But then it's 
do the breakdown yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do it and get it breaking down a bit better. Mm -hmm. And always water it yeah. anytime you put some in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Not that long. Just start long. There's no shade in our yard. Yeah. Well, that's where you can, you know, where's that going? Galaxies and places like that, they have a recycled cardboard thing and they get big fridge boxes. Oh. So you can get the really big cardboard boxes from them and that can help quite a bit in keeping your compost pile covered and shaded a bit. And also you, you can water the cardboard so it soaks into everything and doesn't let it dry out too much. Yeah. Not really. The only, you know, the only guys kind of work. Yeah, see that, and that's what you're going to get from the store. Just so much wood. Yeah. Yeah. If you have that, you said that. What did you say? Lime. Lime. Yeah. And but see, I mean, that's the kind of compost we make. Yeah. It's more. Like compost, and like I said, this was made last November, yeah. and it's compost now. But then this is the stuff we made last summer. If you leave it even longer, then you start getting topsoil out of it. Mm -hmm. It starts turning into topsoil. And really, you want to use it in the active phase, where it's more active. Even this has gone a bit further past, you know, you can see the bit of straw in it. Yeah. But even if it wasn't so broken down, it's better if you can have it not so, so broken down yeah. where you can kind of still see That's what it's close. made of okay. because then that and dug in the soil gives room for microorganisms no, to go I'm in and worms to go in and Alan Chadwick, he's a really good, was very big in biodynamics if you look him up online okay. and he has a lot of information but he said that soil structure is two thirds of and how good the soil is going to be is how good the structure of it is. So if you can have it like silky and nice, then that helps a lot. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, here we're, we really have a problem that our soil is so acidic yeah. off the get go. Yeah. So then adding lime is, for vegetable crops is, is, is really good to do. Yeah. 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 And we, you know, you can buy the granule dolomite lime. Yeah. And it's more time release. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because the white powder stuff sort of when it rains and washes it. just kind of washes it. Yeah. yeah. But also if you have access to wood ash. Yeah. If you can add wood ash to your to your soil in its base. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't you know what to do with all oh. this wood ash. Oh. Oh. Yeah. oh uh, use it up in your garden. And also. I was always, I've always read like not to use it or like use, just be so sparingly with it. Like cautious with it. Cause it can yeah. Don't use yeah. too, too but much. But I can sprinkle That's it on. Sprinkle a bit in. Yeah. Like I know. We, we burn wood fires, so we have quite a bit. Yeah. And what we do is, right before I know it's going to rain a bit, because it's very water soluble, I'll go out with a can and just flick it on my lawn everywhere. And then it rains into the lawn, and you get that potassium getting into the your lawn. And the grass, too. And you grab on the grass, your lawn. So it's adding in, what, what is it adding in? Potassium. potassium potash. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's where we get our flavor in our food is a lot from the potassium and the potash in it. Whereas that's why at one time everybody cooked their food on wood. So they had ashes, so they went back into their garden. But now with electric cooking, yeah, we're, not we, we're not, you're not getting a lot of that real flavor if it comes from that. So if you can use it up, it's good to use up. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, the biodynamic calendar is a really good resource for if you can sow your seeds and work with the phases of the moon, it helps a lot. And it, and it kind of structures you too because it gives you days, well, this is a flower day, this is a fruit day, root day, root day. Yeah. So you're not trying to do everything at once. So it's a leaf day. You work on your leaf crops if it's a flower day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a breakdown phase. We didn't do it. Oh, we didn't show it. Yeah. Yeah, so the compost heats up. Back down, and that's where you want to be active. Yeah. Once you get down more of the stable, that's more like the older compost. Yeah. Yeah. So you really want the active stuff as much as yeah. possible. So use your compost and not let it become top soil. Yeah. But still use it up anyway. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. 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 You want the greatest benefit for the plants. Yeah. Yeah. More of this micro microbiology and microbiology. Yeah. Oh well, next year. Mm -hmm. turn, turn How often do you guys make a compost pile? Is it on Sunday? We're going to make one on Sunday. We, we usually do it spring and fall. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 
then we just save all our stuff up and then renew it. And then do a big pile. Uh, what do you, you save up your manure? What else do you save up? We save up our, you know, our food scraps and our yard waste. And I got a bunch of leaves that I saved for it. Yeah. But yeah, and the, like the spring compost doesn't have as much green stuff in it because it's been all that stuff you're collecting over the winter. Where the, the fall compost has a lot more green material in it because it's all the garden waste. Yeah. Uh, Where did they have the numbers? Five and two. Where did that come from? was on the five senses. Yeah, so that's why it's the 5 0 and 5 0 Yeah, yeah. That confused the heck out of me. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that's, figuring out. That's why. And I didn't yeah, want to yeah. ask. Did you get oh, some of the miracles? No, oh, I didn't. Well, I will give you some here. So, why are these each um, kind of looking like journals? Um, because, well, well, I just okay. talked about the herbs, but also the, the flowers and stuff are encased in parts of the animals. Oh, okay. They cat. So this is, so this old bark, why does it look like this is supposed to be ground up bark? Yeah, it was ground up bark, then it was put into the brain cavity of a female cat. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the other one you have over here, dandelion, so that was dried flowers put in the mesonary part of the cat and then buried over the winter months. The compost preparations are all buried over the winter months. Oh, yeah, yeah. To get to I'm sure. Very uh, what will I say? Mm -hmm. True with it. Yeah. 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 Well, they say stoner. So with, this is from your compost yeah, okay. team? Holy doodle. This is impressive right. stuff. Right. It looks like fudge. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the barrel compost. So that's the um, pound liver and the eggshells yeah. and the salt. The guys were stirring and turning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that this started out as manure and turned into this. So can I farm successfully without cows? I have to get to know. Oh no, you know, you know, abs cows. absolutely you can without cows. Don't don't kid yourself. You can't. So. Because I can't abide without cows. And there, see, that's some compost. We made this last November. And it's ready now. There's kind of different stuff. The stuff you can converse with on it. Oh, so yeah. It has a lot of wood in it. Yes, it and does. And this is stuff we made last spring. And it's kind of turning into topsoil now. No. As you can see, it's still about the middle of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah but, but this, so this is, this is that's, very simple. That's active humus okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, like, this is the. Oh yeah, a huge yeah. difference. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the 500 that how many more the cows want. Oh, Over the yeah. winter months. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the silver. The ground ground quartz. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Compounded with a I, I pick up like the white quartz when I go for heights, save it up, then I beat it with a hammer until it's finer. Then I do it between two sheets of glass. To grind it to get it to the consistency of like talcum powder. Yeah, a lot of love has to be done. But, but you really but, need it. Yeah, yeah, really I mean, it would be annoying. In, in, in three gallons of water, all you need is a teaspoon. And you can't really work it over a You can get all these preparations. And it all has to get from the soil. Yeah, yeah. That's where we've got base compost preparations from. Yeah, you can get them through. Yeah. 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 But you bring, you bring these seeds to the market? Water? Do you do like water? Do you do water? Like, uh, water? Do you do like certain things. What we do a lot no, of is it, it rolls up. Yeah. It's not yeah. like a date that you roll up. Yeah. And we do that so we can roll it out to till up our garden beds. Yeah. When we need to, and then we roll it out for your duration and to grip tape. Yeah. But for the like, keys and stuff, we do, they're on, you know, they're on something to grow up. So on top of that, we have like mister. That we do miss the fall on the leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's so hot. We live right up here. It's so hot. Yeah, it's like yeah. The it's the slow the building. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So it's actually yeah. pulling the water into the yeah, flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, even if it's kind of thing to like cover like the exposed, like to keep the moisture in. I guess you could put it close together, but I find our sort of dry as Yeah, I mean, this, um, this book here talks about very close plants of stuff to make it so that the leaves of this plants almost touch the way they can be. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. I was wondering if you guys are wondering about that. Little Nick Josephine, Kate Hall, 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 Kate H